raise of hands whose first startup grind this is? A lot of people. <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know, Startup Grind started in Palo Alto in California a couple of years ago um, by a man by the name of Derek Anderson. Um, his goal was to uh, basically bring people together, I mean people like yourselves together, uh, to connect in, um, and I guess be inspired by the speakers that we, um, we host. Um, so our next speaker, um, I want you to, in, this is apparently typical startup grind fashion and when I was over in California last year in front of a couple hundred people I had to do a talk in front of, um, I'm sorry, with uh, Tom Conrad, the CTO of Pandora, which is a music subscription service. And Derek um, insisted that I get everyone off their seat. <laughs> so he started off on good vibes. So as, as I'm about to present my next speaker, Scott Farquhar, I hope I've, I've said that right. Um, uh, the co-founder and co-CEO of Atlassian. So, um, so we, everyone, you know, I'd like to give Scott a big round of applause. Standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm really going to cross it off just yet, but that, that was really nice, thank you. <laughs> you may as well just cross yeah. it off right now. <laughs> um, Alright, well let's just get straight into it. Um, um, for those of you that, um, for those of us in the room that don't know Scott, I'm going to get into the basics just to find out who he is um, and what he started. I think 10 years ago now. So, um, Scott, do you want to just explain to us who you are, um, what, what, you, what you started, I think, in 2002 um, with your co founder, Mike, um, and you know, the journey, I guess, at the start? So, I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> um, so, who is Alassian here? Just so I get a rough idea of like, who about a third of the audience, roughly. Um, so, about 11 years ago, um, me and a friend from university started a software company. Um, straight out of university, sort of dropped out of, uh, of my last year of my honours degree. And uh, we both didn't want to go work for a big company. So uh, all of our friends who got graduate offers with PricewaterhouseCoopers or IBM or sort of big soulless, faceless companies. And, um, and I remember that the graduate salary was $48,500 at the time for all my friends that went in the scholarship program. Uh, to those companies, and we thought, well, if we can earn $48,500 and not have to wear a suit and tie and work a corporate life, then we've achieved kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, the mecca. So we started with a sort of meagre uh, or humble uh, aspirations of just to um, have a great time working. And uh, over the years, we sort of built that from the two of us uh, in 2002 um, through to, we have about 600, well, between six and 700 people uh, at the moment, we have about six offices around the world. Uh, we did about $110 million in revenue uh, in last calendar year, and uh, we're growing about 30 to 40 percent uh, year on year at the moment. Uh, our products, uh, broadly, they help software developers collaborate to make great products. Um, so, if you're in the software development industry or related fields, I imagine some of you are, um, you may have come across our products. Um, Jira and Confluence would be the two most famous of them. And they're used by about 25,000 companies uh, in 134 countries around the world. Um, and Mike and I, I guess, have done that whole journey. So we're still the co-founders, co-CEOs. Um, we were best friends at each other's weddings, uh, best mans at each other's weddings. And so we've sort of done the whole journey. So we've seen how the company evolves at each stage. Um, if there's any questions um, that I can answer tonight about that, because companies go through very different phases of growth. Um, and uh, I guess the two things that I really, I, I think early on came up to is I wanted to have a company that um, the, employee, the employees wanted to come work at. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys have had similar experiences, but I remember going to work, sorry, going to lunch with some of my work, uh, or sorry, university colleagues. So they, they'd gone to these other companies and they, we all got back together for work, uh, for, for lunch. And um, they all bitched one by one, went around the table and bitched about their jobs. Um, you know, sort of like, oh, this, you know, this is sucks and this is crap. And, uh, and it sort of got all around to me, Mike, and we're like, oh, no, we, we enjoy our job. 
Um, I guess we had no one else to blame at that stage. And, uh, <laughs> so a few things out of that. I wanted to make sure that my, like, I never wanted my employees to go to lunch and bitch about their job. So I wanted to make sure that they, you know, they had a great place to work. Um, and secondly, almost all the bitching came from people not being in control of their jobs. They say, this sucks, but I can't fix it. Well, that person's an idiot, but they're my boss. Like, so it ended up being this sort of, um, you know, people wanted them, you know, they were really fully invested and, and emotionally invested in making a difference, but they couldn't. Um, so that was one sort of aspect. And the other side is um, I wanted to have a place where uh, our customers like this. Um, and so uh, I guess if you've seen done economics here and consumer surplus and, and so forth, like, I feel like we always want to have a consumer surplus where basically uh, our, uh, people who use our products really love them um, way more than we charge for it. So we don't try and eat out every last dollar. And hopefully that kind of uh, goodwill with our customers in the scale of company we're at um, helps us get more customers over time. So we've always been about, I'd rather have 100 customers paying $10,000 than one customer paying a million dollars because they're going to talk and tell their friends and they're going to love our products. So hopefully over the 10 years of being in, in business, I've achieved, well, it's a struggle every day, but achieved the, the happy customers and the happy employees part. Terrific. <laughs> so it sounds like the idea came second and you just wanted to um, not work for someone. <laughs> that, that was the, really the primary reason. We actually started off doing um, a support, um, third party support for a company in Sweden that sold most of its software to the US and we thought we can, they have great software but shitty support, so we'll provide great support in Australia, which is a horrible reason for so many, you know, so many reasons it was horrible. Um, including the fact that you know, their customers in the US were in Australia, they're in Sweden, so everything took forever and would often get phone calls. I mean, a girlfriend at the time would hate it because I'd get phone calls at three in the morning and you'd sort of get out of bed and you'd have your phone on the loudest possible ring because you didn't want to miss the phone calls. Um, so yeah, that was a terrible business and then we decided our real passion, um, you know, so we sat down, why, you know, we can make money doing a whole bunch of different things, what's our real passion? And it turned out, we said, we actually really like building software. Um, and to, this, to that point in time, we'd never built anything, or I never built anything larger than the university project. So we went from building that to building a whole, you know, a whole software uh, product. Um, but it was really kind of a passion, eventually, of what we worked out, what we wanted to do. So why B2B software? Why enterprise? Like, was there a gap in the market back in the day, or 10 years ago? Like, I mean, did you just think, okay, we'll just do enterprise software, like, you know, compared to the businesses or startups today where... I think consumer internet or e-commerce is, I guess, what's hot right now. Why enterprise? Definitely goes in waves. Um, at, at, at the IPO level, like actually enterprise software is cool again um, due to the flops of Groupon and Facebook uh, at that level. Um, so it does definitely go in waves. And I think for us it was just, um, at that stage, we really needed the product that we ended up put down by and building, which is Jira. Um, so, uh, at that stage, there was a whole bunch of really expensive sort of enterprise um, software that might be $2,000 per seat. Um, but even if you could afford that, you could never buy it because they, you know, minimum spend of $100,000 plus and uh, small companies couldn't afford that. And on the other side, you had open source software, which we've always competed against, um, which was great if you had a couple of weeks to set it up and tweak it, and it still looked like crap at the end of the day. And so we sort of said, well, there's going to be a room in the middle for that. Um, but between the two of those. Oh, sounds great. Um, let's, let's, let's hear a bit of the backstory. Why, what's it like to be in business with your friend? I mean, is Mike, I guess Mike's your best friend um, in terms of the dynamic? Um, have there been some highs and lows? I'm sure there have been some highs and lows. Yep. Um, but what's it like in general? Oh, it's good. I mean, is anyone here a co-founder? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No one can put the hands at the same time, but yeah, right. Like, yeah, so, right. Um, um, didn't want a minute. Um, so yeah, I think starting business with two people is a really good idea. Some people argue three, I uh, uh, probably think that's too much. Um, for the, the reason they are, so we need a tiebreaker. Um, for us, it's always been really good because um, I feel like if you can't convince one other person in the entire world that your idea is worthwhile pursuing, then maybe it's not. So it's sort of good to have that, um, have someone that, there. Um, an entrepreneurial journey. I mean, now we've got Startup Grind and a whole bunch of other um, sort of outlets for this. Um, but at the time we started, we were the only, I was the only person I knew that ran their own business. And so there's such a high and a low aspect of, of running a business. And um, I'll, I'll tell you a few of them. Like, one story that's sort of literally a week apart from the, from the low to the high. Um, so I was in, um, uh, what was it? It was 
Zambia, um, I was basically in Africa, and um, uh, I, got a, I had just finished being on this safari, and we were all day in the back of the Ute, and we are kind of middle of nowhere, and uh, I got back to the hut that night, and uh, there was a, a message, a folded up piece of paper, so I was, you know, Mr. Fuck, but there's a message for you. And you opened it up, and, uh, and, and it said, um, call me urgently, Mike. Um, and so I was on my honeymoon at the time. And you know that, that if you're getting a message like that, and then you know this message I found out later had gone Sydney to the local sales office to South Africa, like, to South Africa, who then called the local field office, who then used a CB radio to the local thing, who then the guy got in his car and drove for half an hour <laughs> on two roads to give me that message. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it's it's pretty pretty important message, um, and you start thinking, well, fuck, like you know, what could possibly be wrong to you know to interrupt me on my honeymoon? And he was also the only person that knew me, so if my parents had died, it probably would have been the same message, right? So everything's going through your head, and there's no phones there, and there's no way of getting in contact, and so we, um, the next day we actually flew um, on to the next town, which was sort of had a bigger airport and, and cell phone reception. I ended up um, being on the phone uh, with Mike, and uh, I found out that hackers had basically hacked into our, um, our systems, and, uh, you know, it would... Again, they had come across an old, um, a really old passwords file that we had decommissioned ages ago, but not deleted. If they're one of those things, you know, we said, "Oh, we shouldn't keep passwords in a database. That's just stupid." Of course, you do that when you're 2002 and you're two guys writing code for the first time. And we decommissioned it and did the things the right way, but we never deleted that old, that old file. And so the hackers had managed to get their hands on, you know, customers' email addresses and passwords from you know years ago. Um, and uh, this is a really difficult time because we were just about to raise venture capital, um, and we actually she just looked at the look at my face. She's like, "All right, let's let's go home." Um, and uh, actually, we then got on a plane, and uh, it's a tiny, small plane, and you know, it's huge runway, and take off to go to the next city. We we're sort of halfway to between where we needed to go, and uh, um, just as we took off the runway. The entire windscreen exploded in oil, and, uh, and the guy had to use the windscreen wipers to see enough to turn around in an emergency land back on the runway. Like five minutes after I was you know, finishing the phone call on the back of the plane, um, and it, it, a jolly old South African guy, and he gets up and goes, Oh, I forgot to put the oil cap back on, it's alright, I'll put it back on, and we kept going. <laughs> so I just rem remember that, and then coming home, and uh, you know, it was basically tag team. So I, I came in and said, Mike, who hadn't slept in, basically three days and handed over and uh, coming in with a clarity of thought and other things made a huge difference. So that was one of the lows where having two people made a huge difference. And uh, I arrived back on Saturday, worked through till Sunday morning at 4 a.m., back in the office at 6 a.m., worked through to Sunday night at 2 a.m., back in the office at 6 a.m., and then flew out, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday to, re to raise venture capital. Um, and, of course, all the venture capitalists knew what we were you know, the problems we face because we reached out to them to find out about security consultants and other things and so we really weren't sure how it would go um, and uh, it was that sort of venture capital meeting we met with five VCs in two days um, and then we eventually got 60 million dollars in funding um, from Excel which was their largest ever um, software investment and the second largest ever investment across any category and so that was that sort of juxtaposition of Woes, you know, kind of like man, the people are talking class action lawsuits, you know, maybe we shut the company down, all that, to, you know, to the high of, hey, being recognised and raising a whole bunch of money um, and, uh, and having that within a week of each other. And I think having a, someone to share that journey, otherwise, I don't know how you'd explain it to someone in a way they'd understand it if they weren't also there going through the same emotional highs and lows that, that you've been through. So I highly recommend having a second co founder. That's great. Um... Speaking of venture capital, um, I understand that um, uh, Alassian was bootstrapped for the better part of eight years. Um, yeah. So, did that put you in good stead for, I mean, I guess until you got your first um, funding um, uh, in terms of acquiring customers, um, finding a revenue model and that sort of thing? Um, or could you have done with, you know, I mean, I'm guessing you were profitable on making money early on, but... Um, how is that different, like, you know, bootstrapping as opposed to, you know, has it changed since in terms of growth and so forth? Yeah, I mean, so for us, the money has basically gone in a bank account in South Bay, like, it hasn't made any difference. So the, the funding we got was more about that Atlassian, we wanted to go from 
sort of like you know a, a medium-sized company to be a company that's around in 50 years, um, and we sort of felt okay, what are the transitions a company needs to go to to be around that stage? And it, it goes from being the Mike and Scott show at some stage through to being a company that has shareholders, an executive team, a board of directors, and eventually sort of you know run owned like as its own kind of company. And uh, we said, okay, well, what are the what different ways you can you can go through that journey? And one of them is to bring on institutional investors who you know have experience of taking a company public, who have a great network of people that we can bring on as board of directors. It signals to a lot of people that um, wouldn't otherwise join a small company that we are you know kind of it's a bit of a mark of um, I don't know, respect or a mark of kind of made it to raise money. So people then look at you as a company. <coughs> oh, hey, they're going places. I'll, I'll jump on board. So it helps attract people. So the money didn't didn't really help us, um, but we bootstrapped for well, eight and a bit years. And uh, I really, I mean, if you can do it, you, you do do it because um, you know Mike and I have retained the lion's share, the ownership of the company, um, and even you know eventually if we went or listing in public, between the two of us, we'd own more than half the company, which is unusual if you're a company that burns through a lot of cash. You have to go through rounds of fundraising, and every round dilutes you, and and, uh, and you're not in a very good negotiating position. Whereas when we eventually raised money, we had five VC firms, and we told them it's a blind auction. Here are the terms. We, here are the terms we want in terms of we wanted you to be pure equity, um, you know, sitting side by side. We didn't want some weird debt stuff where certain situations we get opposite sides of the table. Um, and we gave them, you know, we wanted a simple term sheet and so forth. So we gave them the parameters and said, of let them bid. Um, and so we got the the deal we wanted because we were already profitable, already big business at the time. And um, that doesn't mean that there aren't businesses that can't get done without funding, um, and some businesses will fail without funding, right? Like there's the uh, Amazons and sort of in Googles of the world where it is a winner takes all market, you have to get big quick, um, you know, there's no way to incubate it without, it without cash. Um, so if you're in that market, I definitely recommend you know, raising money, um, but we, it worked really well for us. Why did, why did you choose just, um, just the one investor, Excel, um, rather than, a, I guess, a consortium? Um, it's a good question, it's a good question. So. Um, at the stage we're out of, com of a company, um, we didn't want, I mean, again, we wanted their advice and expertise, but not their money. So they bought a minority share of Atlassian. And at a certain stage of growth, those companies need to put a certain amount of capital at play, you know, at play before they will, um, you know, they'll spend their time in, in growing at the company. And so, um, you know, we probably could have got two investors on. Um, who would be equally invested, um, but again, five or six would, you know, we just would dilute everyone down such that we'd get such a small sliver of time out of each of them. So um, we didn't, we chose basically one person, we chose them a lot of the culture and the person that was going to help us again, it wasn't the money, it was the person we wanted. And um, we chose for us, we wanted to find a reputable firm, like where they had a great reputation, because that means a lot of your contacts. There's no point having a third tier VC firm, you know, where you have a better reputation as a company than they do as a VC firm, um, you know, you sort of like, you want to be able to leverage their brand a bit. Uh, we wanted to find a partner that was still young and hungry, so we wanted someone, there's a lot of partners that have made their personal hundreds of millions of dollars and they're like, yep, I like being a VC, but as long as it does inter interrupt my game of golf, like, I'll do that. Um, and we wanted someone who was really hungry and wanted to sort of make their mark the first time. Um, and then we wanted someone that had operating experience because some people sort of come out of an MBA and go straight into being a, you know, an analyst and then a VC and they never actually run a company or you know, actually have a P&L responsibility. So we wanted someone that had done that before. Um, and then last, or probably most importantly, but like the final decision point is to be like the person, you know, because it's a marriage in some way. Um, you know, we're going to enjoy that person in 10 years time or five years time at the time horizon is. So that's our criteria. Sounds great. Um, you mentioned some of the statistics before, um, 24,000 um, paying customers, customers being corporations, um, $100 million revenue that you hit last year or over, um, and north of 500 plus employees. Um, I also read that you don't have a sales and distribution team. <laughs> um, so how do you hit those numbers without a sales team? Mm. Um, yeah, everyone asks, that's one of those contention points, isn't it? And when you talk to people and say, oh, I, I don't believe it, you know, there's no way you can sell. The interesting story about um, sort of backing yourself is when we first started, so our prices are relatively low, like, you know, so it might be sort of $1,000 to $10,000 would be a typical cost for our products um, in a medium-sized company, which is, you know, order of magnitude lower than what our competitors were selling for at the time. Um, and it's actually an interesting pricing part because once you sell 
above, you know, into double digit thousands, you need a sales force. And once you get into triple digit thousands, you really almost need a sales force that travels and is going to do on site demos. Um, but the cost of doing on site demos, say you would, we wanted every four or five deals, um, you have five people around, they would spend the time on things. Like a lot of that six figure deal gets eaten up in sales commissions, the cost of flying that person around. And so you can actually take a lot of sales costs out of a product and reduce the price. Um, and uh, again, I think that's more applicable these days in the days of the internet because you can sell globally. Um, so your market is a lot larger than it was um, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And so what we did is we priced our products low. Um, we knew that if we were going to price them low, we needed to sell a lot of them. If we were going to sell a lot of them, we needed to sell globally. If we were going to sell globally, then we needed to make sure that it wasn't contact us for a price or schedule a demo. It needed to be sort of a self-service model. Um, everything from in, making it easy to install through to download, through to our pricing being public, our documentation public, <coughs> which was kind of very unusual when we started sort of uh, 10 years ago. And uh, through all this, we, you know, we got to sort of a million dollars in sales. Um, you know, actually, you know, we got to hundred thousand dollars in sales. We've been chatting with one of the local sort of VCs who, you know, offered their time as a mentor. Um, you know, every once or every couple of months to sort of you know see how we were going. And uh, you know, like, well, you made it to hundred thousand dollars in sales. You, there's no way you could ever possibly make it to a million dollars in sales with that with that pricing point. I'm like, oh, okay, well, seems to be working pretty well, but you're a really smart guy. Well, we'll think about it, and we went back and just kept doing what we were doing, and we hit a million sales and catch up for breakfast, and he says, hush, oh, yeah, a bit of an anomaly for a million dollars in sales. You just couldn't possibly get to 10, 10 million dollars in sales doing it that way. Like, oh, seems to be working pretty well. Anyway, um, and so, yeah, we've made a hundred million dollars in sales, and we're hopefully heading towards a billion. And um, uh, the thing about that is, you know, he, he knew the old school world of enterprise software, right? Like the old sell for six digits, get someone on site, you know, sell them a big, uh, a big package. And uh, by selling under $10,000, people can swipe a credit card. So they don't even need to, get, need to go to their boss for approval. They can just sort of swipe it and, and get it done, um, which is a good sort of hurdle in terms of when you're pricing stuff. There's definitely an inflection point in, in, in pricing. Um, and so for us, we haven't had salespeople because uh, in the early days, you know, we would sort of call people up and try and help them out wherever they needed it. Um, and so for the big, the big turning point for us was not our first sale. The turning point was the first sale that we didn't have anything to do with. So we just woke up one morning and got an email with credit card details attached that said, hey, look, you know, want to buy it? And I went, oh, Mike, had, had you talked to that person? Cool. Wow, this is awesome. <laughs> um, and so that was sort of the, the turning point for the business is when, you know, we realised the model could work. Um, and I'm not saying we won't have um, salespeople in the future. I think, again, we'll probably have some products in that six-figure range um, because they have a smaller market size. So a lot of people want to take our products, but they're like, oh, I want to scale it to 50,000 people in one instance. And you're like, well, the market size for that is a very small market, so I'm going to have to charge a lot for it. If I do that, I'm sure I'm going to need some salespeople. But today, we haven't, haven't needed any salespeople uh, to sell our product. But there is, a, there is a considerable marketing team, I guess, to promote. Um, I mean, I know it's all online, but um, is there an offline sort of marketing team that's sort of engaging? Uh, so what's an offline marketing team? Um, not as in, sorry, um, have you got marketing, um, have you got a team on the ground that's sort of um, pitching out or, you know, doing your, you know, your television, your type, those types of ads, not television, but not online. <laughs> um, so when we do things like trade shows, we do, we have a Lassian user group, um, you know, kind of network, I think we have to close to 200 user groups, I think 170 something user groups around the world that will meet on a monthly or quarterly basis. So we've got community marketing there. So is the trade show kind of like that Salesforce um, conference that they do? We have a conference once a year, has yeah. about sort of one to 2,000 people turn up. Uh, no, it's still early um, in San Francisco. Uh, I think that'll grow over time a lot bigger. And so I think it is much more of a winner takes all market than, than it ever was before. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we push, I mean, the word of mouth part um, makes a huge difference now. Like, if you've got positive word of mouth, and it's still the number one reason people use our product is they've heard about it from a friend or they've used it before. Um, and so that's our number one you know, reason. And actually, it's a good thing and a bad thing because everyone asks, why can't you spend more money, you know, can't you spend another $10 million on marketing and get another $50 million in sales? And it's like, well, sort of, maybe. Like, it's very hard to control word of mouth. You just have to spend a lot more time making great products and great product experiences. Okay, so I mean, obviously, um, Atlassian is predominantly a software company. What would you say the split is between engineers and non-engineers in the company? 
We have about half half. Half half. And so the other half would be split between. So support is a large one. So we have about um, about 120, I think, support people. The numbers aren't going to add up, but we have 120 people support people. About um, probably 60 to 80 in marketing and sort of customer facing teams. You know, billing and other aspects that um, you know where customers have uh, issues in there. Um, support marketing. We've got a channel team, finance, administration, back office, HR, um, talent. And this is split between San Francisco and... Yeah, about half our company is in Sydney, about 300 people are in the uh, corner of uh, Martin Place and George Street in the city. And about half our, about 150 in San Francisco and about 150 across other locations. And you split your time between both, I guess? Yeah, about a week a month in San Francisco. Cool. Um, I mean, I want to get a couple more questions out just before I put it back to the audience because I know people have got questions. Um, let's talk um, a few things outside of Atlassian. Um, uh, I've, under, I've read a few days ago in BIW that um, you appointed um, on the board of an online gift retailer like Red Balloon. Um, and then aside from that, um, you're starting a venture capital fund called Blackbird VC. Yep. Um, is this a sign of something that you're going to be transitioning to or...? Is this uh, something on the side? What's, what's... Oh, definitely not. No, I mean, <laughs> Alaska is still my one true love. Um, uh, so, uh, the few things like Red Balloon. Who, who has ever had a Red Balloon experience or sent a Red Balloon voucher or go to the website? Okay, so about 40% maybe. Um, and so, Red Balloon is, is an online gifting company. So, instead of giving someone a pair of socks or a gift that they don't want for Christmas, um, you give them an experience, and uh, it's always been sort of true to my heart, and at Alassian too, we have this big uh, uh, philosophy that, you know, you give someone a $200 bonus, you're never ever going to remember it, right? It'll go on the mortgage, or it gets spent on a Friday night on, on booze, but if you give someone a $200 experience, it could be a bridge climb, that could be a, um, you know, jet boat around the harbour, it could be a, a you know, a adventure race around the city, um, and uh, we've done that at Alassian, so we, every year we do an end of financial year party, and uh, we, we run some sort of, the criteria is, um, has to be memorable, has to get people out of their comfort zone, it has to get people meeting other people in the company they wouldn't normally spend time with. Um, it hasn't needed to be very expensive. Um, and the first year we ran a, um, a race around Sydney, um, sort of race around the world style, and uh, you came into the office and there was a big video that came up and explained you the rules and, you know, sort of a, a theme, you know, a, a Mission Impossible theme with the music going and, a video that we got some intern to create, um, and then the, the first um, the first clue was QWERTY, right? And you know, with the, the cursor just blinking, and uh, I remember everyone's blank faces and thinking, "All right, well, what's going to happen now, right? When someone to come in and tell us what, what really happens?" And uh, some bright spark went, oh, "Well, hang on, let me go check my keyboard." And so under each keyboard, we'd had basically um, the instructions for each individual person as to where they had to go. And they all met as teams in the office, you know, someone had to meet in the basement, someone met in the kitchen, and in each of those areas there was a bag that had a map and a whole bunch of clues for the, for the, uh, for the race. And they spent a, a day racing around the CBD um, trying to find these clues. And, you know, some idea were, um, one was a state library, you had to sort of uh, follow, you know, Dan Brown style, um, you know, follow like a clock, you know, sort of the marble clock on the ground through to a bookshelf and pick up a, a book and get the, you know, 15th word on the 17th page and, you know, then that would then form a clue and then from that you went to a locker and then the locker, you know, those six digit or four digit pins you have to put in, you know, you have the pools and you get your own locker. Um, so you got one of those and then in the locker that had the next clue, you know, you get the pin and the locker and you get the next clue. Um, and then the, the clue that no one, oh, and the other part we did was, um, you get photos, right? So everyone had to bring a camera and you get points for taking photos. And so, you know, you had to take a photo at the 10th floor of a building, right? Like, it's an arbitrary request, but someone just had to go to buildings and press, you know, find a building where you could press the 10th floor and get up there and walk, just walk straight past reception, out the window, take a photo and walk back to the <laughs> um, Had to get a photo in the driver's seat of a taxi. <laughs> which is an interesting one uh, to try. Um, another one we did was getting a photo um, with uh, Japanese tourists um, and uh, in front of the opera house, and you get one point for every Japanese tourist you get the same photo. <laughs> so, you know, like everyone's piling in. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of fun. Um, the clue that no so one got. What if they get the peace sign in there as well? Sorry. What if they get the peace sign in there? <laughs> yeah, there was like one per person or more. Um, 
And uh, the one the equipment no one got was we got the Bond girl, Eva Green, and um, we took a photo, you know, it was a photo of her, and we cut out the wrist sort of area. It's like, okay, it must be something to do with watches and, Eva, and, 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 and the Bond girl. And uh, it turned out that uh, um, it was a little bit difficult for because the only website that said she was a sponsor for sort of spokesman for Brielle watches, but the only um, website that said that was in Italian. So you had to kind of find that out in Italian somehow. And then the only um, place you can buy real watches is in the QVB in Sydney. And so you sort of had to put all those clues together and then turn up at the QVB and, you know, like, and then we, we'd talk to the, the person behind the desk who then handed out the next clue uh, to the different places. And, you know, it was a lot, a lot of fun. And um, so we want to give people experiences. It, it was a big sort of um, passion of mine. And so a good friend of mine's on the Red Balloon uh, board. Uh, well, she runs Red Balloon, one of the founders, and uh, I'm just, like, I, I try as very much as I can to give experiences to friends rather than giving them physical gifts, which often, you know, don't get used. And so I thought, um, they're, you know, company on a huge growth. I think they have a potential to be a, a, a huge brand, like, in Australia, beyond just the experience gifting. They're gifting across a whole uh, range of categories. And so I thought, that, you know, she was interested in my experience running at Lassian, um, helping grow that. So. And that's the root red balloon board, and, um, and hopefully you'll see more from those guys in the next couple of months. Uh, and on the, the venture, uh, bike bird ventures part, um, I've been a participant in a thing called Startmate for a while. And Startmate is sort of a seed funding. It's a program. It's a three-month program. If you've got an idea, um, we'll basically fund you for three months, incubator style. We've got a whole bunch of mentors to come in and give one-on-one -on -one mentorship. Uh, you know, a, um, if you're familiar with White Combinator or um, you know, uh, uh, 500 startups, that type of incubator program in Sydney. Um, and uh, so that's going really well. But we found out there's a lot of those companies or, or startups who are graduating and needing larger amounts of capital and having to go to the US or, um, you know, having to fight with the local VC industry. Uh, and so we said, okay, there's a gap there, obviously, for those ones, but for a whole bunch of other companies in a similar situation. Um, so we founded uh, Blackbird Ventures. Um, and uh, I can't take as much credit as a guy named Nikki Shkabak who was really behind both of them, um, and uh, so the companies, yeah, that are looking for sort of one million plus uh, in funding, they're at a stage where they've got a product, you know, um, go basically we're sort of after global software companies or global companies with some technology aspect of it that we can take to the world, and uh, well, I think we're, we'll be the best in the world at um, building companies in Australia and also bridging that to Silicon Valley as and when as and when it's needed. So, so where's that? Are you still raising the fund or have you made some investments? We've raised, uh, I think the numbers are about 20 million at the moment um, in, in capital that's been committed. Um, and I think we're trying to get that to 30 million uh, in uh, the next couple of months. But um, we have enough to we just start investing. Fair enough. Okay. Um, uh, I think I actually might just put it back to the audience. Um, just I think we're going okay with time. So um, if you've got a question, just uh, speak up really loud um, so we can get it on film. Um, and then we'll just go from there. Up the back. Yeah. I'm just interested in what uh, would probably be the next phase in your organisation, you know, going from a young, hungry, entrepreneurial sort of animal to being a, a stable institution. Fat how lazy. Do, well, I didn't want to say it, but how do you expect to, or how do you imagine you'll keep the company's soul, its enthusiasm, its vibe, into that you know, stage of corporate adulthood? Do you ever need a question? Okay. Um, so, uh, to me, the, the, the way you keep a company as you grow is, um, look at a 500 person company is very different from a 50, which is different from a 5 person company, and you can't expect to be the best at, you know, at each stage, right? I mean, so I want to be the best 500 person company that there is out there, but not you know, try and be the same as a five person company because things offer, uh, happen very differently. When you're a 50 person company, the way you get stuff done is by turning up to someone's desk and bang on it loud enough and they'll get it done for you. And when you're a 500 person company, you can't do that because everyone's at everyone's desk banging and nothing gets done. Um, so the way companies have to, have to get stuff done evolves. Um, and so you think, okay, what really makes a difference? You know, as companies get bigger, right? Like Vodafone or Telstra, or these big companies. Like, what is it that makes a good big company versus a an average one? Um, and it comes down to you know people and culture. And to some extent, they're two sides of the same coin. Like, you know, people create the culture, and culture attracts the people. Um, and so, for us, we spend a lot of time on on culture. We have uh, uh, five values that we uh, that we articulated when we were about a fifty person company. Um, and the value setting exercise is an interesting one because um, when you're a five-person company, the values are the founders' values. Like, there's no distinction between the two. Um, 
And what we found actually was that when we got to about 50, between 50 and 100 people, like us as founders stopped hiring each person individually. Um, and other people started hiring them and they did their best. Um, but we found that a lot of people we hired in that period, um, you know, didn't want the sort of same Atlassian culture that, that we, we'd wanted or didn't have the same performance. And um, a lot of people actually, because we have a lot of perks as a company, you know, they said, oh, I'll go work for Atlassian, I don't have to work very hard. They get paid reasonably well and there's a lot of, you know, beer and chocolate, you know, uh, in, in the fridges. And so we sort of attracted the wrong type. And I said, well, what, why is that? Um, and I think it's because we hadn't really articulated the values of the company. Um, so we went through a process, um, and if anyone looks it up, it's a Jim Collins. You can download a five dollar paper from Harvard Business Review called The Mission to Mars. Um, and basically the idea is you work out who are the people, if I was going to recreate Atlassian on another planet, who are the people that I would send from our company to go and recreate that company over there. Um, and it's not often the senior management team, it's often some cultural you know, stewards um, that you've got, it's uh, some early people, with, it's just people that together would create you know, a company you'd want to work at. And then you go, okay, for those people, why do we choose those people? And then you try and extract the, the values. And we did that process twice, uh, once with some senior leadership and once with sort of some people who've been for a long time. And essentially, I think out of five, the change you seek is a, uh, is a huge, uh, huge value. Um, and actually, to the point where someone wrote an internal blog post about it a few weeks ago where um, the sort of new guy that had just started I uh, was complaining to one of our old employees. He said, oh, look, man, like, the, the people keep spilling milk in the fridge. It's been like two weeks now and no one's cleaned up the spilt milk. And the older employee who'd been around for a while just stopped what he was doing, picked up a cloth, went and cleaned up the spilt milk in the fridge and said, great, it's fixed. And the new employee was like, holy shit, like, you know, <laughs> I've been bitching about it for two weeks and I feel really bad now because this guy's like three pay grades senior than me just cleaned up the thing I was complaining about. Um, but he, he sort of said, wow, that, that's what it means, right? That's what the value means, is that you're empowered to do stuff and you're expected to do stuff. So um, I won't go through all the values, but basically like, they all have some teeth to them. They're all about maybe attracting the right people. Um, and values too, like they should repel people. There should be people, there's actually a guy who came for an interview, sat in a chair and looked at our values for 20 minutes because he turned up early. And uh, by the time I came to the interview, he sort of shook my hand and said, I, I don't think this is the company for me, like, if you're going to use swear words in your values, I'm like, sorry, it's not, not for me. I was like, I was fantastic. It's awesome you saved me a whole interview. You go through the whole paper process. Um, so values should repel people as much as they attract. And hopefully, as we grow, like, you know, like a, a, a thousand person firm, a two thousand person firm will be, you know, hopefully the best thousand person company, the best two thousand person company that we can be. Um, but if it's something that, stay, that, that keeps you up at night, it's things that prevent us doing that, um, you know, and one of the issues we have at the moment right today is uh, we have almost every person in our company doing the biggest job they've ever done, uh, which is common in a startup. Usually we get to, well, I just say to bring the professional managers and people, you know, and we sort of haven't done that, we buffed that trend a little bit, we sort of feel like we can do it ourselves. But as a result, almost every manager is managing a large number of people or a larger responsibility than they've ever done before. And unfortunately, some of those guys are going to fuck it up, right? As you do every time you do something wrong. Which is fine normally, but if your manager is learning on the job, it sometimes affects your, you know, your uh, enjoyment. And so that's one of my worries at the moment is how do we get those first level managers to be good managers really quickly, so that we don't have awesome staff that feel disillusioned. So it worries me a lot. Um, I can't say I've got the answer, but culture I think is a big part. And this gentleman down the front was next, and then I'll take the other uh, sort of two questions, hopefully, that I'll try to get to move into one. Um, back in 2002, well, well, back in 2002, um, the industry was almost dead, like the, 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 after the bubble. Yep. Was it naivety? Do you think it was naivety that got you to where you were, or do you think you had you know, to analyze where the industry, the, the, the economics of the, of the day, uh, and you had just turned a blind eye to it? Um, with, with, what I'm trying to get at is, do you really think it was just... Were we prescient or naive? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, Completely naive. 100% yeah. naive, right? Like, I look back now and I feel like I spent the last... The first year, we made a whole bunch of smart decisions and there were gut decisions and they made sense mm -hmm. and they were internally consistent. And if you look at all the things about strategy, you just have to make an internally consistent strategy uh, rather than one that copies everyone else or does something. And then the last nine years trying to work out why it was successful and not trying to fuck it up. <laughs> so, um, and then eventually you know, I'm like, oh, I can write the HBR case study on us now. I understand why it was successful, but it wasn't that we sat down like, uh, you know, a long time ago and said, here's my 
exact strategy and here's the hole in the market and how it fits and so forth. It was just really, <laughs> okay. we needed ourselves. It seemed, you know, there was no way that we could afford all these things. It really came down to like, we wanted to build something that we wanted to use ourselves and we felt that, you know, the products are really extensible. Why is that? Because they're programmers and we like building extensible shit like every person does. So, <laughs> but you feel the programmers who are our customers. So, um, I think it was complete naivety. Uh, I remember going to open a bank account and I was like, what? Well, what, you know, it's almost like they're going to call my mum when, you know, like, because you don't know what you need to do to get a bank account as a business. You know, like, oh, do I need a business card or a business plan? Like, what do I do? Um, and you just turn up and you start papers. But um, that sort of complete naivety, and I think we just did, we made some right choices. So, um, you know, I know a lot of people either, A, you just go follow someone else into a startup, like, you know, I'll build, you know, like that company in Australia, which I think is doomed for failure. Um, there's other people that are sort of like, let me cast around for a thing that's going to make money and they have no passion about it. And I think that's good for failure. Um, but the other, beyond that, I think if you try a whole bunch of stuff that you think, hey, there's a market there all, because I'm personally passionate about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I couldn't say that, I can probably tell you now, like now that I've all thought about it, like if it's a good idea or not, now that I've more like notches on the belt, but like uh, back then I didn't know at all, like it just happened to be smart. And if you'd asked all about, or any smart person back then, they would have said we were stupid. <laughs> so. Well, that's all leads into the second part of the question. Um, back then, uh, I had actually exited a successfully a startup at the time. So, Congratulations. Um, well, yes, thank you, but uh, it's 10 years ago. <laughs> sure. anyway, um, the point is, Microsoft is just really soft. Now I'm just sort of you know, painting the picture of what it was like back in 2002. And back then it was this big deal internet, I think, and, and big uh, deal source safe. And how do you feel now that, you know, how do you deal with the competitiveness of Microsoft, the 800 pound gorilla when they're in foundation service? You've got very competing products built there and um, they really set the sort of second to market on this. Um, how do how, how you get How do you compete with big competitors? Yeah. So we've always had, from day one, we've always had big competitors. Um, so for us, like we had open source, I mentioned before, and we've always had everyone from Microsoft to Oracle to IBM, Hewlett Packard, you know, a whole bunch of big competitors. Um, and to a large extent, the good part of it is that our business model insulates us from those guys. Um, and um, has anyone read Innovator's Dilemma? It's one of like, my best... Uh, Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen, yeah. So, um, great, great guy. Probably if I had to pick one kind of book to read in high tech markets, it would be The Innovator's Dilemma. And it's basically the idea is that every market gets undercut from below. Like, it's very rare from a competitor to come top down and beat you, right? So, even in mobile phones, you're in Vodafone, but like, Whoever disrupts mobile phone business will do it bottoms up with some sort of simple offering that will then take out the incumbents. And they go through time and time exa examples. Um, the one that's probably most um, applicable to everyone here is like digital cameras, right? Um, and so the idea is that these competitive technologies incubate in another, in another market until they're good enough to disrupt things. So initial digital cameras, well, you didn't use them as cameras. You use them, you know, as kind of like internet video things, right? They sat on your computer or kids' toys. Or like, you know, they were not good enough to have, to have um, um, <coughs> photos. Um, and a normal film camera is about eight megapixels. And so the film industry said, oh look, we'll wait, you know, you can see them getting better and better, but like they need to get to eight megapixels before people will start buying them. And it turned out that actually two megapixels was good enough for almost every person, right? You could put it on an A4 page, page, like two megapixels was actually, you'll get the, the incredible inflection point at that point in time. And so the wordings are that, you know, a lot of your customers don't need everything your product has. Right? They're actually, you know, something that has benefits, like a digital camera, obviously you can delete the photos and you can see what they are and take multiple. So there's a whole bunch of benefits and almost no downside, but they're incubated in a different market. So um, I look at our, our business model and it's very hard, like when you're, you know, Canon to then go into more bad example, like um, Polaroid or Kodak, you know, to sort of go into the other market, right? Because you've got this entire value chain you've built up um, that would be completely disrupted, you know, with your photo processing. I used to sell film when I used to sell all the ink that then developed the film, right? It's really hard to disrupt all that to build digital cameras. And so with our business model, is that we're selling stuff at, you know, under $10,000 for a seat. IBM, like, you know, the salesperson doesn't get out of bed for less than $100,000 for, like, a sale. And so there's just no way they could possibly marry their business model um, into into ours, and so that provides us a lot of protection from the big guys coming down market. Thanks, Anna. So the girl was there. Um, what sort of role does design um, play in your business in regards to engineering versus design? Good question. Um, so, uh, design's one of those things that I think we used to be 
good at it, and then we sort of got bad at it for a while, and now we're trying to get good at it again. Um, and so um, I think you know, design's holistic and everything, like people said, it's just pixel pushing, but I think it's really how your products evolve. Um, and so for us, we've got, um, we're actually hiring a whole bunch of designers, we're trying to hire eight at the moment, or, or, or ten I think, um, designers. And uh, for us, like our products have, we're probably best in class in design when we released them in 2002, and then we didn't keep investing in it every single year, and so we stayed the same, but the industry got better, right? If you look at all the, all the products you were using in 2002, your Nokia phones and so forth, compared to what's out there today, it's moved a lot, a, a lot further, and so we have a lot more investment to do um, in design, and uh, we, we sort of have a triumvirate um, of design, um, product management, and engineering, kind of three people together that sort of build our products, and then we have a separate function of product marketing on one side. Um, and so that's that's where we, I guess, think about design. Is that answer your question? Or sort of? Yeah, yeah. Is it um, sort of a cohesive... Um, environment where you sort of design in terms of um, usability or interface design, not really from a visual point of view, but the way it works, and then the engineers, do they work together, or is it a very... Yeah, so they sit like side by side, yeah, and okay. so um, we don't yet have on every single product a usability tester, a user interface designer, uh, you know, a HTML CSS person, like sort of, we don't have, often we find that each designer has a spectrum of skills, and we try and use those skills across the whole company in different products, and so... Um, we've just completed a pretty a 12 month process of actually rolling out a unification of um, look and feel across all our products. <coughs> Anyone can you imagine you've got seven products and trying to get them all to commit to a new user interface at the same time was a huge undertaking. We're really proud that we've done that. Um, and that leveraged a whole bunch of different people. Um, I don't know where we get to the stage where we have on every product the entire spectrum, but we hopefully across the whole company will do that. Um, yeah, we need more designers. Everyone knows anyone that's looking for, or looking to for a job. We uh, we uh, need to hire a lot. There's a guy behind. Sorry, you got the next one. Um, you said earlier that it was about eight and a half years before you received that big capital injection from Excel. But prior to that, had you received any sort of? I guess this is part of a two-part question. Did you receive any other funding, bank loans, or anything? So it was all just your own money that you put in. Okay. So when you went to Excel, what sort of? Um, things that they need from you? So did you just go in and say, hey, we want money? Did they say, no, stop, we need to see this first? So, well, well, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I'm really proud of the process that we, we ran for those guys. So yeah. um, we're in a lucky situation that a lot of VCs, the market's changed for capital versus you know, startups has changed a lot. And so it used to be that startups would be groveling you know, at the sort of VC's door and now a lot of the good VCs realise actually a lot of the good a lot of good ideas aren't in Silicon Valley, they're not on Sand Hill Road. We need to go find searching for them. Mm -hmm. and we need to build up relationships. And so we probably had we've got a spreadsheet with eighty VCs that have reached out to us over the years, and then we stopped counting after that. We didn't bother. And um, we sort of pre qualified them, right? So for the top tier ones that we had a good relationship with, um, well they had a good reputation, we would you know have breakfast with them once a quarter when I was in San Francisco, maintain a relationship. And so they knew us and They'd seen the history, of, you know, I'm sure their internal ones in uh, our individual department plan. So like, you know, our engineering plan and our IT plan for the whole year. Um, and we said, right, there's everything you need to know. And I'm sure our, our, our um, uh, CFO at the time, like, spent a lot of time back and forth on people. But everyone got the same information. So any time someone asked a question, we put it up for every, every person to, to read. Um, and uh, we gave no forward-looking projections. So we sort of said, that's, that's the business. That's what it has been in the future. Don't ask us to commit to any you know, future projections, because that's up to you to model that, like, you know, you, you do what you want and we're not getting out of the situation. Um, so the upside was that we said, all right, we want, um, you know, one page term sheet, make it really simple, straight equity, um, you know, and uh, as, as, as few terms as possible. And Excel came back, you know, actually they came back the first, with the highest cash offer, with the best terms and the best team that we liked. So that was kind of nice, they all lined up with the same person. Um, and then we had three offers that pretty much costed below that, and then one offer that was almost like they were just throwing it in in case we had nothing else to, you know, to, to, to go for. Um, and uh, the downside was that I'm sure if they were all looking at competitive companies, they, you know, they could use our numbers, you know, they had, they had pretty much everything that we'd ever, ever done in, in that account. Um, so that's probably the downside was that transparency, but we've always been a very transparent company, so that, that wasn't as much a downside as getting the right person on board. So it sounds like really you had them by the... But with Blackbird, what are you looking for 
in those seeking a capital injection? Yeah, so we've done, I've done some investments personally and I've done some investments through ASING. We've, we've taken some small ones. Kind of so I've got a reasonable, I've seen some things go horribly wrong um, and some things go really well. And um, for me, at that, at that size, like it really comes down to the people. Like it almost invariably comes down to who are the people? Do you trust them? Are they smart? Are they want, want, willing to learn? Um, and uh, one of the mistakes I made was someone that seemed smart and, and a good salesperson, but every part of the negotiation was one of those ones where they tried to get every single inch. And what we should have done is just walk away at that stage, right? And so it's actually, if they're the sort of person that, you know, it's not a negotiation, it's sort of they push for every single thing. Um, you know, that's, how does that line up for the relationship? And it turned out that that particular person and company didn't listen to our advice as we went through, burned through a lot of cash, ended up basically out of business. Um, so I think it's 100% of people game. Now, I mean, it's a smart idea and it needs to be going well. Um, you know, you want to fund traction and, and potential. Um, you know, it's all the things like a big market and those things, but it really comes down to, for me, people um, and how well, how well you know how to listen and be humble about that um, and also how keen they are to learn um, new things. So uh, I met some other entrepreneurs. I, I, actually, I think that's a, probably a, a good trait for all entrepreneurs, I think, regardless of whether we're trying to fund them or not. Like other questions? I think we need to Two more questions. Um, just, a, just a quick question about Jira. Yeah. Um, when you guys started off, you, you obviously had some sort of idea what your product was going to do or what, you know, what it would, or, um, how it was going to work. Was there some sort of pivot point that came when you suddenly went, geez, people are starting to use this for different reasons than we first initially suggested, and you realised that you'd really become a platform more than a product? Was there, was there some sort of, was there a point in you know, the journey of the company where you suddenly went you realised that your product wasn't really a product anymore, but you were building off it? Yeah, it's an interesting thing, like, um, our products, like, you know, Jira is an issue tracking system, and what that really means is it's a workflow system, I mean, you know, you have a ticket that goes through a workflow, that's configurable, the fields and the workflows it goes through, and then you say, okay, well, there's a lot of problems that are workflow problems, right? Like, a you know, help desk is a workflow problem, um, giving someone, you know, performance review feedback is a workflow problem, like, uh, Applicant tracking when you apply for a job is a workflow problem, and so we do actually know with a whole bunch of, uh, sorry? Tracking BCs. Tracking BCs is a workflow problem, yeah. Um, so we, uh, we found that a lot of our customers use it for other, other markets, other things or other markets. Um, the interesting part though is it's one thing to have a product that can do a whole bunch of different things. It's another thing to sell it as, as doing those different things. And so um, we've very much separated the product functionality from the go-to-market strategy for us, and so our go-to-market is we sell tools to the technical teams, these product teams that build products. Um, and uh, though it can get used for other other reasons, and we encourage that because it helps us, you know, uh, with, with uh, well, helps our customers be more sticky and, and they love it, and we encourage it. It's hard to sell that. It's hard for me to go to you and say, hey, here's an applicant tracking system that sort of does like half of what the dedicated systems do. It's kind of not better, at, you know, it's a whole bunch of jankiness, but if you're already got installed and you're already using it when all your employees have a login, it's not very easy. So it's, we struggle with that today, I think, to sort of work out having a product that's a platform and then how do we then sell the vertical applications on, on that platform. So, um, yeah, if you've got any ideas of how we do that better, I'd chat with you afterwards. Just one last question, I think. Uh, I think the gentleman at the back was... Yeah, I just wondered about the name at Lassian and um, was that the name of the company from the start? And how did you and Mike or the rest of the team decide on the name? Uh, uh, so Mike had done Latin in high school and I think he was looking for at least one instance in his life where that would be useful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so Atlas is the, uh, the Titan and he was actually a, a naughty uh, Titan. And um, so he got punished and he, he had to stand on the top of what are now, I think, the uh, Atlas Mountains um, and hold the sky up. So when you see the depictions of Atlas, he's actually holding the world up, so it's completely misrepresented. Um, and so his job and punishment was to hold the sky up. And we, at the time, we were a service company, right? We were about providing this third-party support, and we thought that that was the, you know, the original example of a, sort of a huge, you know, legendary service. And so, like, you might have a Herculean effort is something that's really hard to do, and a Lassian effort would be a, an example of legendary service. So that's kind of where the name came, and. Thankfully, people would, would domain, it, domain name squatting back then, so we could name it together. Yeah. There's one last question, if I can take one extra, because there was only one other. Oh, yes. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for your talk. Um, got a question about 
mentors. Um, you mentioned that you did the fundraising. Um, more should get advice and expertise in the VC rather than actually for the money. Yeah. Um, but back when you were, you know, a, a young startup, were there people who um, were mentors without putting millions of dollars in? Um, and how did you find them? Yeah, mentor. Interesting. I, I actually feel it's a real struggle. I think at the moment to find people I really look up to and learn from. I work for everyone in, in various ways, but people I want to spend a lot of time with and learn one, you know, from from one person. Um, and so um, we're actually looking for more board members at the moment. It's a real struggle to find those mentors. Um, if I switch around and say, okay, well, the people that I enjoy mentoring, I guess in terms of, um, you know, is the people are the people that are humble and they really learn stuff and get stuff out of it. And so the people, it was, a, a couple, it was actually one company that I catch up with once a year um, and, uh, and give them some advice. They're slightly smaller but on the same trajectory <coughs> company. Um, and every year I can see that they, they really make a difference. Like the stuff I tell them helps them a lot and they make a difference. And they always send me an email and say, hey, you told me this, I did this and got you know, results out of it. So um, to put around, I guess, if you're looking for a mentoring relationship with people, um, and you meet people, and again, it's way easier to meet people than you think, generally. Um, uh, to make sure when you do chat with them, you know, like you, 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 you try and learn from them, and then whatever you've learned, you put it in practice, and you give feedback about whether it worked or didn't, and be thankful and appreciative. So hopefully that helps you get your own mentors. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, out. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, and everyone just gives Scott a round of applause. It'd be a great help if you just stack your chairs um, in the rows that they are, um, just because they've taken them out. But you're free to like mingle. Hey, and you, you don't do this for any money, right? You do this for free. Pretty much. So every month you get in here or somewhere and you put this on. We just, I mean, we don't make the money out of this much. Yeah, so hey, round of applause for us. <laughs> We do have another event coming up next month um, on the 24th, I believe. Um, you'll have to go online to find out who it is, but um, if you want to come down, much appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Well done.